following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up later, from 9-11 to COVID-19, could it all be part of biblical prophecy? The best-selling author of The Harbinger, Jonathan Kahn, examines the shakings of today and shares his thoughts on what's to come. And 15 years struggling to catch her breath. I'm not breathing enough to make a feather move. Oxygen levels dangerously low. I don't want to live like this anymore. The miracle that cleared her airways. That is mine. I believe that is for me. Today on The 700 Club. Well, welcome to The 700 Club bombshell news from the U.S. Supreme Court. A leaked draft of an opinion shows the court appears ready to overturn Roe v. Wade. Its apparent author, Judge Samuel Alito, writes, Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Many question, re, questions regarding the leaked document remain to be answered. Jenna Browder brings us the explosive reaction from both sides of the abortion debate. It's not the final word, but already this leaked draft opinion that would overturn Roe v. Wade has become a flashpoint, sparking debate and protests. Overnight, a crowd gathering outside the Supreme Court. The protests coming after Politico reported it obtained documents from a person familiar with the court's proceedings. Obviously, someone on the court, uh, either a clerk or a justice, must have leaked this opinion in uh, protest uh, to the majority's views. Those unconfirmed documents are dated in February and labeled a first draft of the opinion in a Mississippi case the court heard this winter. Its apparent author, Justice Alito, writes Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. The draft also cites Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the 1992 case that affirmed Roe. Justice Alito said to be joined by Justices Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. We hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. Law professor Alan Dershowitz last night on Fox News' Hannity says he doesn't think Roe should be overturned, but believes the document is real. I think this was leaked by a liberal law clerk who is trying to change the outcome of the case. And Planned Parenthood tweeting, let's be clear, this is a draft opinion. It's outrageous, it's unprecedented, but it is not final. Abortion is your right and it is still legal. Jonathan Keller with the California Family Council also points out that it's far from a final document and votes could still change. We've seen all throughout SCOTUS history that draft opinions undergo revisions in the final weeks and even days and hours before a verdict is officially rendered. If true, it's welcome news, though, for the pro-life community. The Susan B. Anthony List writing, If the draft opinion made public tonight is the final opinion of the court, we wholeheartedly applaud the decision. This is a hopeful day. But, as I've seen many other pro-life advocates point out, this is not the end. In, in some ways, this is only the beginning. It is now up to us, as pro-life Americans, to show that we do love them both, that we love both children and their mothers. The court is expected to rule on the case by late June or early July. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. This is a bombshell decision, and the court is finally recognizing that it doesn't have the authority to create law. When you take a step back from all the emotional debate, either pro-life or pro-choice, just take a step back. What has the Supreme Court done with this decision? What they've done is say, we don't trust our elected representatives to pass laws, and so we're going to pass a law from the Supreme Court. We're going to create a right that the Constitution doesn't mention at all. And that's what this draft opinion points out. The word is not in the Constitution. You have to do a whole bunch of uh, legal maneuvering just to come to that conclusion that somehow it, within a penumbra of the rights of privacy that the famous Griswold case created, there is now a right to privacy that allows you to kill uh, a fetus. So it, it's absolutely incredible the, 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 the number of Supreme Court justices in their hearings over the past four or five decades 
that have had to go through some kind of litmus test on Roe. The most recent one, and I, please pay attention to what Ketanji Brown said in her hearing. She said that Roe was established Supreme Court law. She was very specific with that term, law. She didn't say it was a decision. Uh, she said it was established Supreme Court law. And I will remind her, the Supreme Court does not have legislative ability to create law. That's the problem here. When the Supreme Court takes away from the elected representatives the power to create law, you put our whole democracy at risk. Suddenly people feel disenfranchised, and it's a group of nine unelected judges who are making law, and there's no accountability. You can't vote the bums out. So this is, I applaud the decision, but I, I hope it takes over the thinking of every law school and every judge, and particularly every Supreme Court justice. Please do not create law. Judicial restraint should be the order of the day. Let the democratic process work it out. And it may take time, it may be unfair to people before you in particular cases, but it doesn't justify you seizing power that the Constitution didn't give you. When you do that, you put the entire republic at stake. And to underline this, in Politico, the very uh, news agency that broke this story, they are calling for the abolition of the Electoral College because um, presidents who were elected without a majority under our constitutional system, every state has a role in the Electoral College. And if you win by an outsized majority in New York and California, somehow or other they're saying, well, you're not elected by a majority of Americans. They're trying to get rid of the Electoral College. They're trying to get rid of the um, uh, filibuster in the Senate. They're trying to say Republican senators don't represent the majority of Americans. They're trying a whole bunch of things that absolutely put our democracy at risk. We, we need to have this restraint. It needs to be enforced. And that needs to be the number one question of anyone sitting on the, on the court. Will you pass laws or will you have judicial restraint? We've got some more news from the Supreme Court, and this time a unanimous vote by all the justice, justices to protect a Christian group's freedom of speech. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, and thanks, Gordon. The justices ruled the city of Boston violated the First Amendment when it refused to fly a Christian flag in front of City Hall. Three flag posts sit outside the building. One flies the American flag, and another the flag of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The third is dedicated to celebrating other cultures, countries, and causes. In 12 years, the city has approved nearly 300 applications flying a wide range of flags, including a gay pride flag and the flag of Ethiopia. But it did deny a group called Camp Constitution's application to run the Christian flag up the pole. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote for the court that the city discriminated against the group because of its religious viewpoint. Matt Staver of Liberty Council said the court's decision means that governments can't keep Christian viewpoints out of public debate. Well, turning now overseas, Israel is demanding an apology from Russia after offensive remarks by the Kremlin's chief diplomat calling Jews anti-Semitic and claiming Adolf Hitler had Jewish heritage. As Chris Mitchell reports, the incident risks an already fragile relationship between Israel and Russia. Just days after Israel remembered six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust by Adolf Hitler, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said the Nazi leader was part Jewish. If I remember correctly, I may be wrong, but Hitler also had Jewish origins. So it doesn't mean absolutely anything. For some time, we've heard from the wise Jewish people that the biggest anti-Semites were Jewish. The statement shocked Israelis and brought swift and widespread reaction. Israeli Prime Minister Neftali Bennett and Israel's Foreign Minister Yair Lapid both condemned Lavrov's comments. The remarks of Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov are an unforgivable scandal. Hitler was not from Jewish descendants, and the Jews did not kill themselves during the Holocaust. We make every effort to keep good relations with Russia, but there's a limit. This time, the limit has been crossed. The government of Russia needs to apologize to us and to the Jewish people. 
Israel rebuked Russia's ambassador while Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky wondered if Israel would go even further. So the question is whether the Israeli ambassador stays in Moscow knowing their new position, whether their relations with Russia remain as usual. Because all of this is not accidental, the words of the Russian foreign minister, a great connoisseur of Hitlerism, are not random. Middle East analyst Eli Kohenim told CBN News Lavrov's comments struck a chord among the Jewish people. First of all, he has his facts wrong to try to suggest that Adolf Hitler has any kind of Jewish lineage in him. And secondly, it is so deeply offensive to the Jewish people, both in Israel and around the world. Kohenim says Russia is trying to justify an unjustifiable war. And the way that they do that is they keep going back to this claim that they are denazifying Ukraine. And what it shows us is that they'll basically say or do anything in trying to justify what they just cannot. The diplomatic confrontation also presents a military challenge for Israel. Russia controls the airspace over Syria, and Israel depends on Russian cooperation to strike Iranian targets inside Syria. Without Russia's permission, it could see Iran's military presence grow dramatically on its northern border. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you, Chris. Russia's foreign minister says the conflict in Ukraine could escalate into World War III. That warning comes as the United States is increasing arms shipments to Ukraine. And the United Kingdom estimates more than 25 percent of Russia's army in Ukraine is, quote, combat ineffective. This as Ukraine is now claiming to have sunk two more Russian ships in the Black Sea. And a senior U.S. official tells the news outlet Axios the Russian army's progress in the eastern Donbass region is minimal at best. Meanwhile, U.S. diplomats are returning to Ukraine Monday, making a day trip to the western city of Lviv with hopes of returning to the capital, Kyiv, in coming weeks. We expect to continue to do day trips uh, for uh, the next week or two. And then we very much hope that the conditions will permit us to go back into uh, Kyiv by the end of the month. Russia is stepping up attacks in western and central Ukraine, targeting armed shipments headed for the front line. While millions of Ukrainian refugees have fled into neighboring Poland, many are arriving hungry and with little money. That's why CBN's Operation Blessing is on the border, providing them with food and other necessities. Right now, we're at the OB warehouse in Medica that is close to the border to Ukraine. We're trying to fulfill a lot of boxes with food the refugees are coming here just with the bags, with the clothes, and sometimes with no money. So we're trying to help them with a lot of food to work with a network of churches and refugees so we can give them this kind of supply so they can help the people that are coming to their places right now. A lot of volunteers are trying to fulfill these boxes so they can have like a healthy uh, supplies for at least two weeks. This will help a family of four people. So we're really glad of all the help that you're providing us. Thank you for everything that you do for us. Such meaningful help. Gordon, back to you. Well, that thank you goes from that warehouse facility in Poland all the way to your home if you're part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. We're uh, not new to this area. We've been in Ukraine for over 30 years. Orphan's Promise has been working for over 20 years. There are all the different Orphan's Promise centers. Uh, that warehouse is just across the border in Poland. Uh, and you're part of this. You're part of this ongoing effort to help the refugees, the, to those who are in need in place in Ukraine, because we're shipping food and supplies back into Ukraine. But we're also helping the millions who are leaving and they need our help. They have no food, they have no water, they have no shelter. They have nowhere to go. They need help because of this horrible war. And we want to stand with them and let them know we love them and God loves them too. You can be a part of it. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to give to the Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line. You can text OB Crisis to 71777, or you can go to CBN.com. We have a lot of different ways you can give. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? 
Well, still ahead, not enough breath to move a feather. This woman suffered with severe breathing issues for 15 years and wound up mostly confined to her home. See how a phone call from her mother led to a miracle. That's coming up. Plus, the flight from public schools where ground zero is Loudoun County. Meet the local pastor with a multi-million dollar plan to provide students with an education that's Christian based. Families are fleeing public schools all across the country. Loudoun County has been ground zero for parents' outrage over school policies. Now a local pastor in Northern Virginia is spearheading a multi-million dollar project to offer Christian-based education. Tara Mergener brings us the details. Nestled in the rolling hills of Northern Virginia sits a sprawling tree-lined campus. Classrooms inside this shuttered private school empty. Once busy halls are eerily silent, each room like a time capsule of better days. But not for long. After much prayer and discussion with our elders and pastoral leadership, we will be launching Cornerstone Christian Academy. With a campus about 20 miles from Cornerstone Chapel, the church will open the school in fall of 23. It just kind of abandoned. Yeah, I know. Initially, there will be enough space for 500 elementary and middle school students. Yeah, they have classrooms, desks, there's the gymnasium, there's a cafeteria down the hall. We're going to repurpose it for the Lord. There are also plans to expand to high school and online learning. Our goal is to provide children an education where they have a biblical worldview so that then they can go out into the real world and be salt and light. The multi-million dollar project is Pastor Gary Hamrick's response to what's playing out in public school systems across the country. We you and we will never be able to in our schools. Kids are reading this and you're going to tell me I can't read it to you? The woman in the yellow trying to break up the fight. Three students killed, eight others shot. I pledge allegiance to the queers. If any religious tradition ascribes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. Do you shut down a club for first graders studying the Bible? Do you feel, you feel good about that? Yes, we do. Loudon is considered the face of the nation's culture war. For more than a year, parents railing against everything from sexual assault on campus. Organizers say the walkout was to show solidarity to victims of sexual violence. To critical race theory, X-rated books in school libraries. They're perverted because that there is no other rational or reasonable explanation. And transgender policies. It's abuse to a child and it's sinning against our God. Tanner Cross's dismissal for refusing to call students by preferred pronouns became the last straw for Hamrick. Our kids need an alternative. We have to ourselves as a church get engaged. What can we do to help give a, a Christian based, a Christian biblical worldview education for our children? Abby Platt, who saw three children suspended for not wearing masks at school, even though the state mandate was lifted, applied immediately. LCPS has lost our trust. And we really want our children to be in an environment that is safe, where they will focus on literacy and learning instead of indoctrination. Loudoun County schools have been the subject of so much controversy, Pastor Gary knew there'd be interest locally. What he didn't expect was to hear from parents in 27 states eager to enroll their children. Cornerstone has been inundated with inquiries, and not just from parents. Teachers want out of public schools, too. By the end of the week, we had over 2,500 students pre-registered. I got over 450 emails from teachers wanting employment. The overwhelming response mirrors what appears to be a national trend. Nearly 2 million students left public schools between 2020 and 2021 with large numbers now enrolled in Christian education. Before the pandemic, many Christian schools struggled with low enrollment. Now there are waiting lists. One of the things that came out of COVID was parents were looking over the shoulder of their kids as they were taking online classes and realizing some of the stuff that's being taught 
is against their own values, even if they weren't Christians. E. Ray Moore, founder of the conservative Christian Education Initiative, calls it a once in a 100 year moment. It awakened in people, many Christians in churches and some pastors, the desire and the recognition that it's our responsibility to provide the Christian education of our children, not the government. The Association of Christian Schools International, one of the country's largest networks, has seen double-digit growth since the pandemic hit. The Association of Classical Christian Schools has added some 10,000 students. The number of homeschoolers has doubled, and new Christian schools are popping up all over the country. We're seeing a resurgence in in homeschool co-ops and hybrid homeschools and learning pods and uh, both churches and communities and even cul-de-sacs of people that are becoming very creative in what is good quality Christian value-based education. With many public schools mired in controversy, interest in Christian education is expected to keep rising. Do you think that this is part of a revival or a part of an awakening of people because things have gotten so contentious. Yeah, it's definitely part of, of a revival that I hope sweeps across this nation in different ways, not just in terms of schools and education, but what is happening in our churches. The sleeping giant has been awakened and parents begin to realize when their kids' future is at stake, we need to get involved. Like many church leaders, Hamrick believes Christian schooling is no longer a nicety, but a necessity. In Middleburg, Virginia, Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, there's been a revolution going on in education for some time, and now it's breaking out into the larger public. But that revolution in terms of homeschooling has been around for a long time, and during COVID, it absolutely exploded. Now it's to see churches say, no, we, we, we can't take this anymore. And the realization, and it should be a realization for every parent, for every grandparent, there is indoctrination going on in schools. And you look at the history of public education in America, public education was designed to teach children how to read, how to write, how to uh, do math, these kinds of things, because it was presumed that an educated population would make for a better democracy. But unfortunately, when that educational system turns into indoctrination and you're trying to teach people that somehow the United States of America is bad or we haven't lived up to all our aspirations and therefore we need to tear the whole system down. I'm, a, I'm not making this up. This has been part of curriculum. We have to tear the whole system down. If that's being taught to our children, then we have no hope in our future. So how do we do this? Well, we get together and people of goodwill to say, how do we raise the next generation? How do we pass on the liberties that have been given to us and give them wholly to the new generation? We need to stop the indoctrination. And boy, that's been written in newspaper headlines over the past two years. You don't have to look far to find out what's really going on in these schools. And it absolutely turns your stomach. So let's get together. Let's do it. Let's make sure our next generation has the liberty that we all enjoy. Terry? Well, up next, lethargic days and sleepless nights. This woman suffered from dangerously low oxygen levels and sleep apnea. A CPAP didn't help. You'll see what did cure her in an instant after this. Plus, the best-selling book now explodes on the big screen. Jonathan Kahn talks about his new documentary, and that's coming up. When Valerie Martin began struggling to breathe, she no longer felt like a normal person. She began using a CPAP for sleep apnea, but it gave her little relief from sleepless nights and brain fog days. Then Valerie got a call from her mom, and soon she was healed in an instant. I thought, and I started, and I thought, I'm not breathing enough to make a feather move, but I could only get here to like the middle of my stomach here, and that's all the further the air seemed like it was going. For 15 years, Valerie Martin struggled to breathe normally. She was lethargic all day, and accomplishing even routine activities was a chore. 
It all started in the summer of 2007. It really frustrated me because my quality of life had drastically changed. I no longer felt that I was functioning as a normal person. Now, the once active Valerie was mostly confined to her home. Trying to avoid a trip to the doctor, she used a medicated salve at night to open her airways. And I would put it uh, under my nose uh, and around my nose so that I could be able to breathe better at night. It helped some, but it didn't help enough. After two years of suffering, she finally went to the doctor who diagnosed her with sleep apnea. He sent her to a sleep specialist who told her that her oxygen levels were dangerously low and prescribed a CPAP machine. Like I used this thing for a year and a half and you felt like out of that year and a half, you got like five or six good nights sleep. And I thought, this is not working. Valerie says by now, her mind was always in a fog where she couldn't focus at home or on her job as a caseworker at the Early Learning Resource Center. My mind is, is not working and I'm just trying to struggle to be able to understand what I've got in front of me here, what's going on. So it was very embarrassing. Valerie trusted God to heal her. I could just say, just Lord, I, I, I need your help. I can't do this and I don't want to live like this anymore. Then, on October 15, 2020, Valerie was at work when her mom, Irma Jean, called and said she'd heard a prayer of healing for Valerie on the 700 Club that morning. At home, after work, she watched the show that re-aired later that evening. Then, she heard Terry say, There's someone else you have yes. breathing issues. You, you just never seem to be able to take a complete breath right now. Take a complete breath and exhale as Jesus Christ heals you completely. And I thought, <laughs> that is me. I am going to claim that that is mine. I believe that is for me. For the first time in years, Valerie slept through the night. The next morning, she knew God healed her. I can feel that air going clear down to my stomach and back. I've not felt that. I was like, <laughs> it was exhilarating. Valerie hasn't had any breathing problems since, and her mental clarity is improving every day. She encourages everyone to continue to trust God for their healing, no matter how long you have waited. Keep believing. Keep remembering that he loves you and that he will never leave you nor forsake you, but he will always, always be there walking this out for your benefit and he will heal you. Keep believing. I know some of you have struggled for a long time and you, you almost stop asking for it because you don't think it's coming. But can I tell you, I don't understand why God waits sometimes on these things, but I'm telling you, it's it's a situation that's common and you need to keep believing. Keep asking. That's what the Bible says. Keep asking. Keep praying. Keep coming to the only one who can make a difference in your circumstance. We want to pray with you today because the Bible also says where two or more are gathered in his name, asking his will, he's there. He's with us and it'll be done. So let's pray together today. Many of you have needs that we don't know the specifics of, but God does. He knows your name. He knows what you're needing. He knows your situation. I want to mention that we have another answer to prayer here just to encourage you before we pray. Debbie of Luttrell, Tennessee, she suffer suffered from extreme stiffness in her lower back that hurt deeply every day. She was watching the 700 Club on March the 1st of this year. She heard Gordon quote James 5, 14 and 15, encouraging viewers to get some household oil if possible and do what scripture says, lay hands on the place that needs healing. So Debbie did that. She put her hand on her back, placed her faith in God for complete healing. She later called CBN's prayer line to report she is free from the lower back stiffness and pain that she had had for a long time. Gordon. Prayer of faith will set you free. Here's Dolly from New Kensington, Pennsylvania, diagnosed with spinal stenosis 15 years ago. 
It prevented her from doing things she loved, like playing with her grandchildren. And then Dolly was watching the 700 Club April 4th, just last month, and heard Terry say, someone has spinal stenosis. God is healing that condition for you, and you will know, because the pain has been slowly subsiding, and it will be gone. Well, by faith, Dolly claimed her healing. Later, she called the prayer line to say that she's been healed and has complete freedom of movement. That can happen to you. All you have to do is do the same thing. And the same thing is real simple. Believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the one who was sent. Believe that he died for you. Believe that he has forgiven all your sins, that you stand before him justified, just as you, if you have never done anything wrong. Isn't that wonderful? You have complete freedom from the law of sin and death. And in that freedom, you can go boldly to the throne of grace and say, Daddy, could you heal me? Could you heal my body? I can't do this. The doctors can't do this. But you can do it. And would you do it for me? And would you do it right now? When you have that childlike faith, wonderful things happen. Miracles happen. We're going to believe for you right now. Terry has already quoted the scripture, when two or more agree together, touching anything, it shall be done. So you reach out and touch. We'll reach out and, and agree with you as you touch. And God will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you as little children believing. Believing in your forgiveness believing in your sacrifice, believing that your blood speaks today over our bodies and our lives. And it speaks healing. It speaks forgiveness. It speaks of your infinite love for us. So Lord, wash us clean, make us new, remake our bodies to be whole. You want us to have health, you want us to have life, and that's why you came, that we might have life more abundantly. So we receive it now in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. There's someone, you have some kind of a degenerative bone disease, and you are in chronic pain all the time. In fact, the pain is so deep that it's just kind of, um, it's not, just an accepting of it it's just a, it's just a constant ache throughout your body and it's be, it's beginning to twist some of your bones god's healing you from that right now just lift up your hands thank him for it begin to praise him for it receive it you are being healed in jesus name i don't know if this is the same person but there's someone you have brittle bone disease mm. and you say i've gotten used to fractures in Jesus' name, he is restoring your bones. He's able to even remake how your bones are made. And he is giving you that. He's giving you life. He's straightening out everything. He's removing all the pain from your body now in Jesus' name. If someone else, you have an issue with your hearing. It's odd. It kind of comes and goes, almost like you, <laughs> out of the blue, you'll just have this sense of like a closing of your your hearing on one side and then at another moment it will open up again god's clearing all of that up for you your hearing's going to be absolutely perfect in jesus name um there's someone you're you're pregnant it's been a difficult pregnancy for you and you're experiencing false labor and and you're just crying out god when 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 will i when when will i deliver and you and you've got fear God is with you. He's giving you his peace right now. In Jesus' name, let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. Everything is going to be normal. You'll have a normal delivery. It's going to be wonderful what God does for you. Just rest in him right now. Let go of all that fear in Jesus' name. There's someone else that this was spoken the other day, but you have a bleeding ulcer. And uh, even though it was mentioned the other day, you never, you just never really received it. Receive it now from Jesus Christ. It is being healed in his name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice for us. For while we were sinners, 
you died for us. Thank you. Thank you for your incredible love. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your healing. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Share your good report. Call us 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up, but prevails until you get the answer. So we want to stand with you in prayer. It's our honor, our privilege to do so. Call us 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, a sneak peek at the new film based on the blockbuster book. This documentary not only tells you the mystery of the Harbinger, it shows you. Stay tuned for a look at the harbinger of things to come. That's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. COVID infection rates in the Northeast are approaching their highest level in three months. The rise comes as BA2 and other subvariants continue to spread. Scientists are watching the spread of two subvariants in South Africa. Here in the United States, COVID cases in kids are on the rise and hospitalizations are climbing in 30 states and territories. New York City now raising its alert to medium risk, but officials are not requiring masks indoors. Well, many believe America is certainly in need of prayer these days, and this Thursday, believers across the country will come together to pray. The National Day of Prayer Task Force is joining forces with Pray.com to host the gathering. This year's theme is Exalt the Lord Who Has Established Us. It comes from the New Testament book of Colossians. CBN News will carry the live stream of the 2022 National Day of Prayer broadcast at 8 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. You can watch it on our website, cbnnews.com. Remember, you can also get all the latest from CBN News at cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. The roof collapsed and nine-year-old Balan was hit in the head and knocked out. She and her family survived the monster 8.1 earthquake that hit southern Mexico. Their house was obliterated. 57,000 homes were destroyed in southern Mexico when the worst earthquake in a century hit the region. Nine-year-old Balan and her family lost their home and barely escaped with their lives. The roof fell. A tire hit me in the head and knocked me out. A brick just missed hitting my baby brother in the head. After the quake, Balan's dad built them a shelter, but it was drafty and sometimes wet inside. It was so cold sometimes that I could not fall asleep. I had bad dreams when I did sleep. My kids were sick all the time. We didn't know what to do. As a farmhand, Balan's dad earns $5 a day, but there was nothing left over to rebuild their house. Then one day, CBN's Operation Blessing learned about the family and decided to build them a new house. In just a few days, their new home was finished. God bless you for helping us and for making us all so happy. That God bless you goes from southern Mexico all the way to your home if you're a member of the 700 Club. People around the world are saying God bless you. They're praying for you because you cared for them in their hour of need. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join with us. It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. If you are a member, could you consider increasing going to 700 Club Gold at $40 a month? 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month, and a portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people in need. Here at home, we're providing food, we're pro providing disaster relief right here in America, but around the world, we're rebuilding homes, we're providing fresh water, we're providing free surgery. It's all because people like you care enough to give, so call us. Now, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express, that's electronic monthly giving, Bank doing all the work, and we save so much on the processing, we can send you monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the Internet, you automatically sign up. You can also text CBN to 71777, 
and a monthly giving form will come up on your, your smartphone and you'll sign up for Pledge Express. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Tara? Well, up next, Jonathan Kahn reveals a prophetic mystery that he's kept hidden for 20 years. Find out more when Jonathan joins us live after this. In 2011, Jonathan Kahn's first book, The Harbinger, exploded on the world scene. Now, more than 10 years later, The Harbinger of Things to Come is hitting the big screen. Are the shakings that have come upon America and the world from 9-11 to COVID-19 all part of an ancient mystery, a prophecy, a warning of what is still to come? From New York Times bestselling author Jonathan Kahn comes an explosive and mind-blowing motion picture, The Harbingers of Things to Come. Welcome back to the 700 Club, Jonathan Kahn. Jonathan, wonderful to have you with us today. Always great to be with you, Terry. Will you talk about why you decided to make this documentary that's based on your book, The Harbinger? Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, and it's the harbinger part of it is just a little part because most of it is what has come after. That's not even in the book. Um, what Terry, for those who don't know, the harbinger is revealing the uh, ancient mystery of judgment that America is going through right now that is replaying a nation under judgment, starting with 9 11 and starting with these appearance of these harbingers in the land, but it hasn't stopped. What started then has been coming true. We are, but if you look at where we were, were with 9-11, it is, we are far more racing away from God right now. And that is part of the mystery. That's what happened to ancient Israel. So it is more critical now than ever. So uh, the, the the idea was to get this out now and get this also onto, you know, I've never done anything like this before, onto movie screens across America. So the harbingers of things to come, again, it's going to be most what has not been revealed. Um, and it is what has been, what is happening now, that's part of the mystery where things are going, what does the future hold, what do we need to know as believers to prepare for that, uh, is there hope? And it's also, you know, there are things that I, I heard in the in the, in the, the prequel there, um, there are things that I have held back for years. There's prophetic images that I have never shared that, that for the first time it's going onto the screen. So um, we are praying, not only this is for believers to as a wake-up call, but also for non-believers. If, if, if believers have friends who need to know, not just the people in their life who are believers, yes, bring about, but also to bring out unsaved people as well, because it's very hard to argue with it. It's kind of going to be like a prophetic explosion happening on movie screens across the country. And originally it was a one night event. It was May. It's May 12th. It is. But they've been selling out. So it's going to be May, May 19th also. And I'm praying that people come to the first and then bring out people who are not saved as well. Uh, for it's because it's a wake up call that really it, the hour is late. Jonathan, will you talk a little bit about you talk, and of course, we know 9-11 and the Harbinger came out and we read all of that. But what are some of the things that are affecting us right now that are Harbingers that are occurring? Yeah, well, you know, one thing is that, again, it has not stopped. And one of the things that was really foreshadowed in the Harbinger is that America was going to keep, I mean, except for revival, is going to follow the course of ancient Israel. Um, what has happened with COVID-19, even, even this? I'll tell you one of the mysteries, um, and that is that, that, um, that actually begins with the Harbinger, and that is that when the first strike, the, the pattern of judgment is there's a strike on the land and it's limited, it's an attack. Well, that was 9-11 for us. Then there's a period of years where the nation's given a chance to come back, but then greater shakings come. Now, when you look at what happened with Israel, with Jerusalem, the first strike came in 605 BC. The greater shakings came in 586 BC. So to put it together, that's a 19 year period, 19 years. It's linked to judgment. Well, I always wondered, is this gonna follow now? Well, 9-11, happened in 2001. If you count 19 years, the, tw the, the 19th year is 2020, the year when the shakings and the plague comes upon America. I was always looking at 2020, wondering, and it happened. And the thing is, Terry, the prophet Jeremiah, when he spoke about what would happen in the 19th year, one of the things he said, this is for Israel, is that a plague would come on the land. 
And what is the name of this plague? It's COVID and then the number 19. So even this is part of it. And not, and not only that, I mean, we're going to go into even where it came in America. The day it came is all part of the mystery. And where is it all going? So the COVID pandemic happens. And how does that play out in the Harbinger movie? Well, it's actually, this was one of, the, one of the things that God uses as a wake up call um, that happens. It actually, it's actually gonna show not only the, t the, the year, but the very day that it happened. You know, Terry, that if you remember, remember when New York uh, passed that gruesome law about killing babies up to the time of birth? Well, well they did it, they, they, and, and the governor chose to light up one of the nine harbingers, which is the tower there in pink to celebrate it. Well, when COVID came and, and the, you know, it, the first case in America, patient zero, uh, it was headlines all over America. And if you look at the date next to those headlines, the date was exactly one year to the day when New York, you know, did this, passed this gruesome law of killing children. And it was January 22nd. And the thing is, it's the same date that America legalized the killing of children. So this is very relevant right now. And even where it came, I mean, we, you know, when we're going to find the places. It's, I'm actually taking the viewer on a, a kind of mystery journey to places where there are mysteries like uh, islands, you know, and there's one island in New above New York that is all part of this mystery that is revealed. So um, it is all playing out, Terry. I mean, it's it's kind of, it's very stunning. Can I ask you what it was like for you? You narrate the film and you actually went to the places where various harbingers happened. What was that like for you? <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm actually, I'm throughout the film and yeah, well, I've, there are places I've never been. Of course, I've been to New York and we go there and Washington, but actually on, uh, we, we went, we had a chart, a charter ships, boats to go to these islands that uh, on which were like, like one of them, there's a mystery that's embedded there that from the beginning of America, and that is saying what's happening now, a prophetic warning. Um, but literally, I mean, but going on there was like Alfred Hitchcock, it was the birds. We had to fight off the birds, you know, it was, there was spiritual warfare. We'd be filming in New York and people would come up to us to stop it. I mean, it was just, I, I know the enemy doesn't want this, but so it was a real adventure. I've never been on so many boats in my life. Can I ask you what the hope is that the movie offers? Because harbingers are frightening. What is the hope? Yeah. 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 Well, you know what, Terry, I think without without warnings, there wouldn't be any hope. I don't, you know, people ask, is there hope? There's always, I mean, at every one of my books, there's always hope at the end. And so with The Harbinger too, but you know, without warning, we're not gonna wake up. And so so the, the actually I go through how actually God changed the history of America through the hope that he gave. And, and the, the only hope for America right now is, is revival because without turning, there is no hope. But you cannot have revival without repentance. You know, after 9 11, everybody's rushing to the churches and their hope, you know, they're, they're saying, God bless America. But there was no repentance. And so we've actually gotten worse. There has to be repentance. The, the key scripture, of course, is if my people. And that there's two things on that that's my people, that's us. And then it's if. So there is a big call at the end about what, not only what we have to do for the future uh, to prepare, but also what America has to do, what we have to do for that. And actually, for me, Terry, this is our also the most exciting time. So it's not only revealing all these things, but it's also calling to what we need to do for the future. Wow. Well, I want our audience to know that the harbinger of things to come is going to be in theaters across America. There are two dates, May the 12th and now May the 19th. So to find out where it's showing and how to get tickets, log on to CBN.com and we'll try to help guide you through all of that. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us. It promises to be a fascinating and hopefully a warning to people who go to see it. Gordon? Oh, thank you, Terry. Oh, it's a blessing. Well, we leave you today with these words from the book of Amos. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to the servants, the prophets. One of the secrets that's been revealed to us is if my people, that means Christians, don't expect non-Christians to join in. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Let's claim that word today.